everyone. Lovely to be here. Lovely to see you all. Um, it's such a privilege to be um, at the Positive Pathways Conference. Um, and, you know, a huge congratulations to Roger on a fantastic talk. So, my name is Jo Yi Cho. Um, you can call me Jo. Um, and I'm the director of the Olympias Music Foundation. Uh, and the topic of my talk today is sustainability. Now, sustainability has become a bit of a buzzword. Um, you know, we talk about sustainable business models, sustainable environmental practices. Um, but in the context of this talk, um, sustainability for me, um, in the context of music education, um, is about uh, a music education um, which allows for sustained engagement, uh, a music education um, which sustains young people for their whole lives, um, and for those for whom it's relevant and who want that, um, leads to a sustainable music career. And so that's really what I'm talking about today. So just very quickly... Um, so, just a quick introduction to the OMF. Um, I'm going to be really brief about this, but if you want to come and chat to me about this later, please do. Um, the OMF um, is a music charity based in Manchester. We're 10 minutes up the road in Longsight. Um, it's an area in the top 1% of urban deprivation in Manchester, the top 10% um, in the UK. Um, and that's really quite stark, considering all of the privilege and wealth um, and opportunities which are available on Oxford Road, the university district. Um, and so, um, we have two strategic aims. The first is to provide... Uh, music lessons to children from low-income families in a very sustained way. So that's one-to-one -one lessons on a weekly basis. Um, and the second, it really kind of uh, resonates with Roger's point, um, which is about supporting families and communities to support those young people. Um, and that's really all about using music as a, as a catalyst uh, for community integration. Um, so I've got a couple of photographs. Um, oops. This is Dara. She's having clarinet lessons with us. Um, so at the moment, we're working with 46... We have an, an aim of reaching 165 children with our weekly music lessons by 25. Um, it's one of the workshops that we ran at Stoller Hall uh, not long ago uh, with the Northern Chamber Orchestra. Um, this is a project, oops, Daisy, um, with, yeah, I'm going to do it like that, um, with the RNCM Pop Department, with um, our older young people. Um, we also do some work in SEND schools as well. Um, and... Uh, our Voices of Hope Choir for Refugees and Asylum Seekers. So um, a lot of those women uh, who are in that choir are the mothers of the children um, in, in our uh, programmes. Uh, and finally, probably our most important project at the moment, Migrant Voices, uh, which is a network of 60 musicians from 27 different countries who we are bringing together to provide inspiring, relatable role models for our young people. So as I said, that's just a whistle-stop tour of some of our projects. Please do come and chat to me if you'd like to later on today. So I have three provocations today for you, um, which are underpinning my talk. Um, the first provocation, or question rather, um, is what is the purpose of music education? I think we're all um, interested in delivering music education, but why are we doing it? I think this is a really important question that we always come back to um, in our delivery. Um, the second is, does the music education we deliver enable young people to make choices about the kinds of music that they make? So that's in relation to genre, um, in relation to cultural styles, um, in relation to the, the way they transmit and communicate that music. Um, and thirdly, um, depending on the answer to the second one, how do we enable young musicians to make those choices through the music education that we deliver? Um, and again, for those um, who go on to uh, have professional aspirations, uh, sustain a career doing that. Um, so to illustrate why these uh, questions are important, um, I'd like to introduce you to Mohammed, not his real name, but very much a real person. Uh, Mohammed is one of the children um, on our... Uh, music programs. Uh, Mohammed is eight years old. He lives um, in Longsight, just up the road. Um, he has ADHD um, and autism, um, and his parents um, are very, very supportive of him having music lessons. However, they've had very negative experiences of going into concert halls. They felt very excluded. They weren't sure if they were wearing the right thing. They clapped in the wrong places. Um, his uncle, however, is a celebrated musician um, in Pakistan. He is the equivalent of an OBE um, for his services to the tabla. Um, and so uh, Mohammed is really interested in the music um, from uh, his parents' place of birth, even though he was born in Manchester. Um, so for the last uh, 15 weeks, 16 weeks, um, he's been receiving one-to-one -one cello lessons through the OMF, and he really likes um, his lessons. He's learning mostly in a classical vernacular, but he really enjoys that. But he's also really interested in other music, despite not having a lot of musical references, mainly through television and film. Um, so the question, I think, for all of us as music educa uh, educators, practitioners, facilitators, is at this very young age of eight, what do we do, or what do we have to do, to enable Mohammed to reach his musical potential? 
Um, and I think in order to be able to answer that question, we have to ask ourselves first what the purpose of music education is. So here's a list of suggestions. Some of these actually, um, some of these uh, answers actually come from cons uh, consultations that we've had with various organisations. Some of these suggestions are actually Deborah's. <laughs> uh, some of them are mine, actually. Some of them are from other arts organisations. Um, depending on what kind of organisation you are, you're going to have slightly different leanings, perhaps. So, for instance, if you were a school, um, you, you may use music education as a way of uh, trying to support transferable skills. You might be interested in whether or not um, learning a musical instrument is going to help your, you know, your pupils be better at maths. Um, if you're a conservatoire or an elite music college, probably the thing that you're really interested in is producing elite performers um, and developing audiences. And there's no right or wrong answer here, but I think what's really important is that we have intentionality um, in what we're delivering and what purpose that's for. And more importantly, that we also think about participants' reasons for having music education and not always as arts organisations and practitioners delivering on what we feel the purpose is. What is it that Mohammed feels the purpose of his music education is for him? Um, and that, again, really goes back to this idea about choice. So, does music education in the UK allow us to choose what kind of music we make? Well, if we have a little look at the landscape, this is not a comprehensive list um, of, of all the different ways that we can make music, of course, but these are broad brushstrokes. So if you can afford to pay for music lessons, most likely what you're going to be receiving, what I received as a child was one-to-one -one, um, lessons over a sustained period of time. You might join a youth choir, a youth orchestra. Um, you might pay fully for your lessons. You might pay a little bit of money through the music hubs. Um, and those are the kinds of things that you're going to be engaged in. If you are receiving subsidised music education, um, say through the National Plan for Music Education, most likely you're going to be receiving first access tuition, 30 to 1 teaching in schools. You may be able to access opportunities through other organisations, one-off projects um, or programmes. But in the, in the most part, those projects um, are going to be fairly short term. So if you're lucky, for instance, your school might have uh, guest artists coming in. Um, and this is, this is just a broad brush. There are lots of organisations doing fantastic things, you know, outside of this too. But uh, by and large, this is kind of the situation that we're faced with. And, and my question is whether or not this set of opportunities is actually enabling musicians to make choices from a young age about the kinds of music they make. And I would argue, and this is only my, my take on this, I would love to hear your feedback, um, is that in both cases, um, we are limited from a young age about the kinds of music that we would like to make and the kind of professional careers that we have. If you're going down the paid route, the people who are making the decisions about the kinds of music you do, if you're going through that traditional ABRSM exam route, um, are exam boards and music conservatoires, and you know, to a very large extent, orchestras, programmers, who are dictating the value um, of certain musics to us. And so that's the kind of music that we train to do. If you um, are going down the subsidized route, um, you probably have a lot more breadth of opportunities. There's going to be a lot, you know, we're really lucky in Manchester. We're really lucky just in this room, actually, that we've got a real breadth of uh, people thinking about inclusive strategies of, um, you know, having a range of opportunities for young people. Um, but very often, um, I feel, those opportunities rely on a facilitator to help you get there. And perhaps once that project has ended, may not allow um, for that participation to continue after the project. So how do we allow the young people to make choices about the music they make and do that on their own once a project has ended? Sorry, that was my question, really. <laughs> so there you go. So this is the million dollar question, isn't it? So how do we do this, um, this really important work? And I feel um, that really the responsibility lies with two groups of people. And the first group of people it lies with is us lot. So um, the, first, <laughs> the first group of people with whom that responsibility lies um, is music educators. So we have a responsibility, if we want to deliver a sustainable music education, to give participants the tools to make music independently, to give participants the tools to make music with other people. This is outside of a project, once a project has ended. To give participants multiple frames of reference from which to choose how they develop their musical voice. Um, to give participants skills which allow them to create art outside of music. So there are the lots and lots of contexts which we use music in theatre, in dance, you know, with visual artists. What are the ways that, in which we can equip young musicians to be able to take those skills into different realms? Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and... Oh, sorry. Uh, just back to this one just for a second. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, and probably most importantly of all, and this goes back to the issue of sustainability and sustaining musical engagement, um, a, a, a sustainable music education is going to support lifelong enthusiasm for engagement and for those who want it, a career into the profession. Now, I said there are two groups of people who have a responsibility. Um, and the second group of people, that more broadly, is the music sector. So what does the music sector need to do to enable young people to make choices about the music they make and to have a sustainable, not just music education, but relationship with music through their lives? Firstly, it has to fund music education properly. Um, it's, not enough to, it's not enough to have you know, drop-in sessions, free tickets and performances, all very well and good. Teachers need to be paid properly. Those opportunities need to be available to everyone, very much what Roger is saying. It's really uh, this mythical thing we talk about, free music education. It can exist. It should exist. Um, it's important that the music education sector uh, treats music education um, as a key part of their programs, orchestras, you know, performance organisations. You need to be treating music education as the pipeline for your performers and audiences. It is not a bolt-on. It is not something that you can just stick on so that you get your Arts Council funding. It has to be integrated into your programmes if you are going to be having that long-term impact. Um, the music sector needs to be embracing music and modes of transmission beyond um, just the Western vernacular. We need to be, as, as Roger says, embracing uh, you know, the, the vast range of global musical traditions um, that make up music. You know, it's not just about Western classical music and Western pop music. There are a lot of different musical styles which are not validated and not given enough, um, we're not given enough opportunity to explore and you know, to explore with young people. Uh, the sector needs to be providing, probably most importantly, inspiring, relatable role models. And that's really about representation, isn't it? That's really about being able to go to a concert and see someone like you. Um, and that really can only happen if we're starting at this very, very early stage. Um, the, the, the music sector also needs to be thinking about certain traditional practices that we just do and we don't think about, we take for granted, that actually make people feel very excluded. Um, you know, having a dark room, for instance, you know, people who don't feel comfortable with that, you know, if you're clapping and that can be very traumatic, or if, you know, you, you're being made to wear certain things. I mean, are these things really necessary for us to be going to a concert? Well, not necessarily. So I think critically we need to be engaging with those things. Um, and finally, um, again, going back to this point about sustainability, the music sector needs to be providing sustainable, positive pathways. Aha, uh -huh, you see what I did there? Uh, for young people interested in a professional career to do that. And it can't just be orchestras. It can't just be being teachers. There has to be more than that. And there certainly is more than that. And that really is the responsibility of the music sector, um, to be supporting those young people to, to go somewhere and for, their, for, someone, for them to end up and have a career, not just hand to mouth, but one which is rewarding and financially sustainable. Um, so, just to finish, um, I have a little quote for you. Um, so, I'm a very keen gardener, uh, and I think maybe I'm just a bit sentimental at the moment because uh, it's spring and all my seeds are germinating, it's all very nice. Um, and my partner recently uh, bought me a book. It's called The Overstory. I don't know if any of you have read it, it's about trees. Um, it's very nice. Um, <laughs> and there's a quote in the book that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. And the next best time to plant a tree is 19 years... No, I'm joking. The next best time to plant a tree is now. And so I really challenge you today to think about the ways in which we can be making a positive impact, not just thinking about it, oh, we'll do it at some point, you know, these are sort of very abstract things, but what changes can we be making today? So that's the end of my talk, and thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>